All right, everybody. Um, we are grateful to be here. Uh, my name is Craig Sawyer. I founded Veterans for Child Rescue. We are a partner organization of Palo Alto Predators. We're based here in Tucson. And we address child trafficking specifically with exposing the problem and running joint operations with federal and local law enforcement, arresting the predators and putting them in prison to rape no more. So there's a lot to that. There's a radio show, there's a television show, and a documentary series coming, and then a major feature film. Um, but that's that's the way that we are in this fight. I can tell you a little bit more about our family and our daughter's story, what happened to her here in Tucson and all that as we get into the nature of this crime. But um, that's kind of my direction. I, I came into this from the highest level of counterterrorism and the SEAL teams and SEAL Team 6 and then federal law enforcement and then high threat mobile security for Department of State and the intelligence community moving our senior officials around the war zones. Um, it's a lot of those people that I've met and worked with at the highest level that I've brought them to my board and my team to help me run these operations uh, to combat child trafficking here in the U.S. So, Great. Uh, pleasure to be here with Joe. Yeah, likewise, and thanks for everybody for coming. Um, my name is Joe Sweeney. I'm the founder of the Acervo Project. Acervo is Latin for Protect, Watch, Overguard. Uh, how, how I ended up sitting here today, it, 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 uh, the story started six years ago. My background is law enforcement. I was a Pittsburgh police officer. Most of my career was SWAT and bomb squad. And then after 9-11, I had an offer to go to work for the U.S. government, where I worked at Homeland Security for four years as an explosive security specialist. And then I got into government contracting into the anti-terrorism training arena with the State Department where we fly into countries, we train, equip, and mission support these allies of ours that do what uh, Craig and his team were doing out there combating terrorism in their countries. And it was in this role where I simply, in 2016, I was in the Middle East working and a friend of mine called and said, hey, I, he had been rescuing kids for years. He was a former intelligence officer. He said, hey, I got a couple kidnapped American children in South America. Can you, can you come and give us a hand? And I said, hey, I'm out of pocket for a few months. So we talked, and, and that simple conversation, which I think a lot of these conversations may be starting amongst you today for the first or second time, drove me down a path to start researching kidnapped American kids. It was that easy. I just started looking at kidnapped American children. And for the next eight months, it consumed my life. Um, what I found out was not only shocking to me, but embarrassing. Uh, at the time, it was 26 years, 25 years of law enforcement and federal government service, 20 countries. I lived in the Middle East for a year. I never saw it to the epidemic that it was. So in 2017, I, me and my wife had some conversations and I said, hey, we gotta do something. It, it, you know, God stuck this thing right here and it's still here today, six years later. And, and she actually looked at me and said, what are you gonna do? And I didn't have an answer. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I said, but look at this. And, and she was as horrified as I was. I said, but we gotta figure something out. I, I just can't take this career that I've been blessed with and I mean that, it was not a work of my own. God was gracious, because I made more mistakes than all of you put in this room together. So what we did was we leveraged our, our friends, our colleagues with all these different skill sets, and I started calling law enforcement agencies, federal government agencies saying, hey, tell me about this problem, tell me why it's grown from 20 million to 30 million to 35 million people a year, and it's hundreds of billions, hundreds of, billions of dollars. And they all basically had the same answer, They're like, yeah, we don't have the manpower budgets to keep up. And some of them even sort of off the record said, and to be quite honest, nobody really cares. They're like, it's a forgotten thing. They look at this as, well, this is just that level of society, that's the route they take, and they make bad decisions. So we basically built a model, not too unlike what Craig does, but ours is a little more focused. Um, we have four or five analysts right now working. We hunt child predators online. We try to identify them. We try to identify their locations, who they are. We build a dossier. We also do investigations on, on their other networks. We basically hand that over to the law enforcement, our federal task force in Pittsburgh, and some state and local agencies that we work with. 
and we try to save them about eight weeks worth of work. So we try to reduce the caseload so they can turn the cases around faster to adjudicate and hopefully convict. We also have a training and education piece where we're partnering as well with Lisa. Um, Power of a Predator, we started that last year with her curriculum combining with our presentations. So we've been into junior and senior high schools for about this past year and we spoke to about 1,200 kids, which took us three years to really try to get into the schools to start having conversations. So the timing was really good to meet Lisa and we hope to triple that by December. And we partner with recovery organizations. We do rescues of survivors, victims that may be uh, targeted while they're in recovery. We've done some of that, provide safe transportation. We have a safe house in Pittsburgh where we pay for that. 80% of our work's in the U.S. The other 20% were in a few other countries. Not that we were looking to do that because it's expensive, but um, just with my relationships and friends in these countries asked us to help. And that's Uganda and Cambodia and Nepal. So we rescued some kids there. We're paying for their school, their uniforms, their books, their medical bills. And when they run away, we pay to go find them and bring them back because the trauma that they've experienced in these countries is just like here, it's, it's undescribable. So once they come in our care, they're ours till they age out. And even then when they're 17, 18, we're gonna work with our partners to find them work, more education and uh, whatever it takes. So that, Well, when I founded Vets for Child Rescue, it was a friend of mine from the CIA that had grown up in the area that I had just north of Houston, Texas. And he was saying, hey, Craig, the area that we grew up, it's now become the hottest epicenter for child trafficking in the entire country. And when he described it to me, it was so upsetting that I thought, how is it that I am at the highest level of counterterrorism and go into all these other countries around the world trying to stop evil from coming here and harming those that I care about when it's been running at full tilt behind my back the whole time and getting worse. And then I realized that <coughs> child trafficking in the United States, it's now at an estimated, even before the wall came down, 38 to 50 billion. So it may be up 90, 100 billion dollars. I don't know. <coughs> I know. I know the companies that are flying, at least one of them, flying children from the border into other countries, uh, other uh, states. And I know the tail numbers, and I know the companies that are there chartered under, and the intelligence agency that those companies charter to, and I know some of the companies that those tail numbers are registered to have been out of business for years, and I know that the, the flights landing in these airfields are landing at 3 a.m. when it's illegal to land there past midnight, and I know that they're labeling the contents as cargo rather than souls, and I know that they're loading off dozens of children and putting them in privately owned vehicles and, and leaving the air filled in the dark at night with no government representatives anywhere to be seen, no, uh, no apparent paperwork changing hands or anything like that. And I know Jim Saki said that um, the only thing going on with going on with that when when asked in a White House briefing when was well there are flights that were earlier than you and I might like to take, but that doesn't mean that there's anything going on. Well, I would submit to you folks the thought that if that is the federal government taking children and reuniting them with their biological parents, that is not something that needs to be run like a Mena Airfield, Arkansas, narcotics drug drop, the way that it's being dropped and run right now. Something doesn't add up, right? So what the numbers are now, I don't quite know. Uh, they're estimating because this is all very, very dark and covert. But I realized that the nature of the problem is that we, the people, are not informed on it. I had an above top secret clearance for over 30 years at that point. I'm like, why don't I know about this? And I decided this is a, a covert domestic operation. It's run at industrial scale and it enjoys almost impunity because the people don't know. So it enjoys a lot of top cover, a lot of elected officials and, and public figures benefit from the way that it is against the children. And so it enjoys, this crime enjoys a lot of top cover. So I realized 
coming from the covert realm, exposing the crime, ripping away that protective veil of, of secrecy and top cover is, is the worst thing that you can do to a covert operation. So that's what I meant to do, and that's why I founded Veterans for Child Rescue. And as soon as I put in the, for the paperwork for it, our daughter got taken from the Subway sandwich shop right down here on Speedway late at night, and a serial rapist put a knife to her side and said, you're gonna do exactly what I tell you or I'll kill you like I have all the others. And he led her off into a night of nightmare that I won't try to describe here. But we were awakened with a screaming daughter on the phone um, before sunup and she was, she managed to get away from him back to her car and she was speeding home. And anyway, long story short, she decided to fight back and put this guy away rather than just take the easy way out. And you, you can look him up on our website, v4cr.org. He was put away for 68 years. It took two and a half years to, to bring him through the legal system here. He was allowed to go through 14 public defenders and eventually represent himself. That trial was a, was a whole different story of its own. But anyway, they put him away, so he'll never get out of prison. And our daughter served with us as a junior decoy agent in one of our joint sting operations with five other agencies, and we put nine predators away, uh, seven while she was there and two more follow ones. So she decided to fight back, and a lot of other people really tend to gain a lot of inspiration from watching her fight back and that whole thing that we got to do with her. But we spent three years filming that documentary, so I encourage you all to watch it. It's at ContralandMovie.com. It's a free good faith public service alert. It's a powerful feature film documentary. You will be more empowered for having watched it. And please share it with everybody you know. Can you add? ContralandMovie.com. And it's also linked to our website, V4CR.org. With the number yeah, four? Yeah, number four, yes, ma'am. So that's. And what, what we learned with it is that MS-13 are selling children now. Uh, Mexican drug cartels are selling children. The Crips, the Bloods, some of the, the youngsters, are, they're selling themselves. Parents are selling their children. There's a lot of different ways that this looks. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of judges and DAs and AGs that won't prosecute these crimes because their campaigns to get into those seats were funded by a, an infamous globalist billionaire who's founded over a hundred subversive organizations. He hates the United States and he funds the campaigns of these, these judges so that they will not prosecute these types of crimes. It's a glaring conflict of interest and it's one of the things that we can and must do something about uh, to turn this around. But, I'm going to shut up for a, a while and let Joe talk. Oh, no, hey, brother. No, it's good. It, it's <coughs> in our conversations today in, in this problem as well as <coughs> before today, not only the top cover, as, as, as Craig mentioned, it is we have cases where we have had convictions seen for eight years. We had one last, last month where the guy was convicted for eight to 10 years up in Connecticut. He got out of jail in November. He did six and a half to eight months, I believe of an eight, eight to 10 year sentence. Our analyst picked him up in uh, March, already online, trying to find a 13 year old girl to meet for sex. Uh, we, we expose it fairly easy, um, but you know, it, it, and part of the other difficulties in fighting this, okay, that's great, right? We still had to strategize who do we hand this to because we talked about handing it to his probation officer Probation officers are overworked, underpaid, and a lot of them just rubber stamp the things because they got a stack of things on their desk every day. So we turned it over to Homeland Security, who's one of our strongest partners on the task force, and said, I went in and I said, hey, please use Homeland Security office. Don't call the probation officer because it's going to get buried. And they did. But you think of the time it takes, right? We got to get the meeting, we got to get in the room where we can't, you know, where we can talk freely. But <clears throat> It's not only the top cover in those things, it's the corruption. Like Craig just mentioned about these political attorneys, judges, legislators, a lot of it's on the demand side. 
This is a crime of vulnerability of, killed, of, of children and young adults and manipulation by predators. They identify the vulnerabilities and they exploit it and manipulate it. If, they, if there's no vulnerabilities there, they'll create them. We've had cases where girls have dated somebody for six months, unbeknownst to them, you know, they go back to a room or a hotel, they have video cameras set up, filmed it, and then they leverage that. Uh, we have a girl that's been trafficked for eight years. I could find her tomorrow. He flies her to Brazil. We're tracking all of her social media, Paris, and she's now just so controlled. Uh, she thinks he's a, her boyfriend, and her life expectancy is probably not long from today. The average age of a person in this is seven years. They either somehow find their way out, they overdose, or they kill themselves, or they find themselves in the crossfire. We've had girls uh, who have come to us with a network, and before we could even start to sort through the information, two of them were killed in Chicago under a drive-by. We reach out up there to say, hey, this wasn't a drive-by. These were bottom girls who were looking to probably leave. A bottom girl was somebody that knows a lot about the operation. They're like, we get 10 homicides a weekend. What do you want us to do? You know. So these are all these struggles, and that's earlier we talked we have to get together as a force multiplier. Folks like you that are out there as well, your, your boots on the ground, you're out there dealing it with kids, you're dealing either in community services, social services, education, maybe some of you are in law enforcement. Law enforcement is doing the best they can. But when you talk to a detective who's been a friend of mine for 20 years, I had a pedophile case on a silver platter to hand him. <coughs> he said, Joe, don't give it to me. I said, what are you talking about? I said, there's minimal work here, we did it all. He goes, I got 265 cases on my desk. He said, you know how many detectives there are in the unit? Me, and I'm getting one new one next week. And to train a new detective in this type of crime takes a lot of work, uh, and it's a lot of stress. So, you know, I think by today and even by this session, you probably have a pretty good idea of the problem, you know, and it is the social bombardment of this social media campaign on our kids. They're normalizing <coughs> what this sex should be with CRT. They're normalizing it with state legislators on the West Coast who are promoting laws for a group called MAT, right? Minor Attracted Persons. Are you kidding me? So you wanna legalize pedophilia? They, they, say, they have these medical experts that say, this is a natural thing. We, this is, this is not harmful to children. This is the way things are meant to be in this nature or whatever type of ideology, twisted ideology they have. So this is a social war as well as all the problems it takes within the crime itself. And something you mentioned about the parents. I, I've had three cases where the interview started and the first words out of almost three out of the out of two out of the three interviews were, well, my mom starts selling me for sex at three or four years old because she was a drug addict. She was 21 years old at this point. And we had a three hour interview and this girl was stoic. I mean, she was, she was together, although she, you could tell she, the trauma she's been through. She gave me every single network that she could give me, phone numbers, of course they're old, but because as soon as she escaped out of it, I'm sure they changed them, but this, this is the kind of thing that's occurring. We speak to thousands of people. I never turn a meeting down. And I'd say 50% of these talks, sometimes there's 50 people, sometimes there's a couple hundred. 50% of them, I have people coming up to me telling me how they were abused as kids. That's just the ones that are coming out. And, it's, and I started to realize this a couple years ago, like this thing's bigger than I thought it was. And I'm still learning, you know, we're five years into this. That's why we're partnering with organizations. Um, we have a really good set of skills within our organization, and we offer them to vetted, trusted partners because there's a lot of organizations out there you just gotta be careful, so. But uh, it's gotta be a call to action. It, it really does, and, and I equate it to Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It took 20 years for that organization to finally get laws changed because they were tired of their kids getting killed. You know, when we all grew up, you know, they were called roadies. My dad worked in the steel mill, man. He's like, he grabbed a beer, we're going up to the food store. And that's the way it was in the 60s and 70s. Until these women were like, you're killing our kids and you can't be drinking and driving in these cars. And they'd had a movement, but it took them 20 years. 
we are smarter, I think we have more technology, and we can educate ourselves, and we can have louder voices. It shouldn't take us 20 years to start turning this whole deviant social behavior that's grooming our kids from very young ages. In the 40s and 50s, a science fraud by the name of Alfred Kinsey started politicking. He was running experiments, <clears throat> essentially raping children, and marking every manner of convulsion, passing out, screaming, um, so forth as orgasm. Because that's what he wanted it to be. By his own description, he was a sadomasochistic pedophile <laughs> whose own genitals were mutilated according to what he preferred. So he was a very, very sick man. Well, he went around politicking to all 50 states, to our psychological health care system, our educational system, and our legal system. That was in the 40s and the 50s. Now he's considered the father of the sexual revolution. The, inst the Kinsey Institute <coughs> remains the recipient of multi-million dollar donations and grants. And it's still taught, he's still celebrated in universities everywhere, as though we don't know. So there's a, and Dr. Judith Reisman will re remain on our board in perpetuity because she is a hero of mine and she was a true champion of children, for children. She dogged Alfred Kinsey for 50 years. She passed away last year, we lost her. Um, but what a, a shining example of what one person can do. She went around exposing him and the last study that she did, uh, Liberty University is uh, pieced together how the CIA was funding Kinsey. Now, why an intelligence agency would fund a science fraud to normalize an epidemic of harm and trauma to normalize child rape, I don't know. But she uncovered that. And so we can each do something. And while Joe and I are kind of laying out the what is, what's happened, and the normalization campaign of this to, to try to beat us into submission and, and, and let force us into uh, somehow going along with the notion that raping children is, is somehow normal and good. The good news is it's all an opportunity for us to change it. And we each within us have the power and the tools to change it and networked together. We can ram this thing right back where it came from. Well, in my opinion, the, the very pits of hell. Uh, Kim is here with us today. She runs a lot of our social media and website and so forth. And she sends me update reports on the hashtags on Instagram and Facebook, for example, that by the week are getting increasingly banned. So do you know you can't write save the children, save our children, protect children, defend children? A lot of these hashtags, whenever they start gaining traction and people start sharing them, Facebook and Instagram bans those hashtags so they will not work. Why? Why? They won't say why, they just do it. All of these hashtags, how many of them do you think have been banned now? About 12. Okay, so anything that really starts gaining traction that speaks to protecting children, not allowed. So that's what we're up against. The, the people that are benefiting from it don't want it to change. There's a lot of top cover, it's censored, it's suppressed. Uh, big tech launders censorship for this. I mean, I'm, we, we're watching it in real time, we deal with it every day. I had to found Vets for Child Rescue because I couldn't crowdfund the, uh, the documentary Contraland. GoFundMe, um, YouCaring, PayPal, all took active measures to prevent us from illegal measures I would submit to keep us from just crowdfunding to make the documentary, <clears throat> to expose this. And um, so I had to found Vets for Child Rescue, a nonprofit org, just to rally the money to make the documentary, to alert the populace, to change the culture back to one that's protective of children, just to spare millions of children from this. So I was just a busted up father and veteran with a broken heart for the kids, trying to bring a documentary and the war
that was leveled against me to prevent this from happening. And folks, I'm telling you, Contraland came out in 2020. It aired to 90 million households and on Daystar in the US and Canada. Not one word of that documentary has ever been refuted because we were so careful. We have world-class experts and survivors and victims and witnesses talking about every aspect of it and it's law enforcement operations with a 100% conviction rate. There's no refuting what's brought in Contraland. The opposition's only method to combat this is to censor it and stop me from bringing the truth to the populace. So that there is a war on against the children, but the good news is every day for everyone is an opportunity to do some good. Here I was a busted up veteran with just an idea, I need to expose this and now when I go speak publicly, people are hugging me, sometimes with tears in their eyes, saying it's working. Craig, be encouraged. People are having the conversation. It's starting to resonate. People are starting to go, wait, what? People are starting to get ticked off that they can't go and address a, a school board member and say, hold on, sir or ma'am, why is it that I had to find out through some tricky way the curriculum that my young child is being taught in your school that is so vulgar, so pornographic, and so perverse that if I posted it on social media, I would get banned from social media as an adult because it's so vulgar and inappropriate and unacceptable. Why are you sneaking this in private and keeping the parents from it? What's going on with that? Why is that mother called a domestic terrorist now by bureaucrats cowering behind razor wire fences who are supposed to be representing us. They're not representing us, they're representing someone else. And one of the dynamics of that, if you've seen the things going on with Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, they run intelligence operations and they take elected officials and public figures and they invite them to their islands, to their mansions, to their resorts and they have every manner of debauchery there for these public officials to follow their nose and get involved in, and the entire resort or mansion or island is wired with covert cameras, and whenever those public officials follow their nose and do whatever they're inclined to do, it's on video, and whoever hosted that event has that, and they then control those elected officials, not you and me. We don't get what we vote for anymore. It doesn't matter if you have children. You can't say this doesn't affect you because you don't have children. It absolutely does. Because you're voting for one thing and you're getting the opposite in return because they serve someone else. And so once we know that, we can all start going, wait a minute, this is an ugly game. But we have the numbers. Our country was set up for we the people to have the say. If only we just will. We can't sit at home, let the opposition destroy everything. We've, we've got to start networking and, and collecting our thoughts and our agenda and go, okay, look, we want just people to stop raping and selling children. Can we just do that? And start, you know, I'm gonna let Joe talk again, but I spoke to uh, the elected officials, the, the senators and congressmen in Texas at the Capitol building a couple weeks ago. And what I told them is, we're creating a scorecard where we're gonna judge you on your performance against child trafficking. If you're a judge, if you're a senator, if you're a congressman, what is, what's the legislation that you're signing off on? How many predators are you putting in prison? How much education are you allowing into the schools to prevent this? What's your track record? Because if it's abysmal, we're gonna vote you out and put someone else in who will. We're gonna get active and we're just gonna start getting hot and hold your feet to the fire. And the good ones said, awesome, please do. I'll sign anything you want. So we can do that, folks. So I just wanted to say that before we went too far, because I know we're bringing a lot of news that's maybe painful and disgusting, but it's factual. But don't let it beat you down. Let it encourage you to go, oh, okay, I can be a hero too. I can do something. I can become a Dr. Judith Reisman. I can become a little Aspen Sawyer who fought back and, and put her predator away and nine others and inspired millions of little girls that couldn't find their own voice. And they saw oh, Aspen Sawyer fighting back and seeing these guys get cuffed up and then like, you know, I, I get moms approach me, hey, my daughter really took inspiration for yours. And I'm like, 
from yours. I'm like, thank you. So there's stuff that we can each do, all right? And there are websites are loaded with tools on how you get plugged in, links to law enforcement, what to look for, all this kind of stuff is on our websites. So Power Over Predators, powerful stuff. Joe's got great stuff going on. Vesper Child Rescue does. So we're all networking, and you guys can too. And bless you all for coming and be a part of this. Because I know you wouldn't be here if you didn't care. So we appreciate you guys. All right. <clears throat> yeah, to, to tag on, I spoke Tuesday in Pittsburgh at a all-day summit similar to this. <clears throat> it started out four months ago as a pastor's conference on anti-trafficking and child exploitation. Eight pastors signed up. So a month and a half out, the people organizing it said, man, we're just, we got 20 people, eight pastors. So they opened it up to legislate. There were two state senators sponsoring this as well. Got delayed, had to postpone the graphics and the marketing because the lawyers had to get involved. Well, what are state senators promoting pastors for? This thing went back and forth. And we weren't sure if it was gonna go, but it went. And they opened it up to community leaders, rotary clubs, law enforcement. I spoke to two DAs who for the first time in five years since I've been in this, said, we have information to share with you. That's usually not the case. So to Greg's point, progress is being made. There are people starting to listen. These two state senators are sticking their necks out there. And I know a few other state senators in Harrisburg in our state's capital. They're friends of mine, you know, they walk the fence and they're good dudes, but it's a, this politics and this, well, but I wanna get this money for the parks for my district. And hey bro, we're talking about these kids who are being, who are being abused, a lot of it in the church, a lot of it while they're in school, and everybody's putting it under the rug. The coaches, you know, the teachers, we have to make sure these people are exposed. We have to tell the stories as difficult as they are and empower not only these children, but their parents, because a lot of the parents don't even know what's going on. Like this whole CRT, and, and, and they're starting to talk to these kids when they're in the third grade about, well, you can be who you wanna be. That's insanity. That's the definition of insanity. And I'm not that old that I'm not in touch with what's going on in the world. And progress is being made. There is hope. And you guys are proof of that coming here today. This is a full, a full house, I think, Lisa said. And when we met Lisa, the partner on the education piece, it was a blessing. We had presentations for high school, but you know we weren't sure how to approach. We met Lisa. She says, here, here's what I got. It was a no-brainer, man. We start working together. We develop something. And that's what this is about. I mean, there is progress being made. It's a dark topic, and you're hearing a lot of bad things, and you might even hear some more bad things before we finish today. But take that as an inspiration to motivate you. For me, it was shock and a little bit of an embarrassment of, like, how did I not know this was going on? I have three daughters, seven grandkids. Fortunately, you know, the... They kind of grew up before this social media. You know, they're in their 30s now. And even some of their, some of them had some rough roads, mixed up with the wrong crowd and had some pretty horrible things done to them. And uh, these grandkids now, I mean, they're all part of this. They understand it. And that's what we do. It's, you know, you used an analogy earlier, which was perfect. that said, reach your hand inside a, a bear's den to the cubs. What's that mother bear do? I mean, you're not getting your hand back. Mm -hmm. And that's, we gotta go after the moms. Dads too, Dad, dads are awkward. Well, <laughs> you're looking at two here, you know? <laughs> Having three daughters, I used to have hair. Uh, <laughs> and, and guys, with, as being on the SWAT team, they'd make fun of me in my truck. They'd open my thing and I have all the girl stuff in there because they're in soccer, sports, cheerleading. They're like, what's this? I'm like, bro, you gotta be prepared because <laughs> I'm still learning how to raise three girls. But, Pink cleats in your truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. My, my one daughter it was a figure skater, and uh, she was pretty good. But I'm down there at 5 in the morning with all the skating moms, and then there's me. <laughs> and I had a mother come down one time. She goes, well, I'm new to this. What, do you, what, what should I bring? I said, your checkbook. It's not <laughs> unique. It's the most expensive sport. And I see my buddies whose sons are playing hockey. They're like, hey, what are you doing down here? I'm over in the figure skating. So, you know. But... You know, our, we're close with our daughters, and it certainly was a tough time when they were teenagers. Now it's even worse. And you've got to build that relationship with these kids. You can't say, take your phone away. 
you know, when they take these phones into the bedroom, you might as well open the gates to every predator that's on these platforms. I mean, the analysts are on them every day. I see the conversations. We analyze, analyze which ones we're going to continue on because we know some are just, uh, they're going to be on for two weeks and leave. I mean, it's a whole process. And just taking their phones is not the answer. We had a case, the mom took the phone twice. She was 16. She went to Walmart and just bought another phone. And I didn't know you, I, I, thought, I thought you had to be 18. Apparently not. The relationship with our children. And it, it might be rough at first. You might have some bad relationships with your kids. With my daughters, they weren't always that great. Uh, now, we're as close as we can be. You have to make sure you're involved. And if, you, if it's so caustic with your kids or your grandkids or your nieces or nephews, and there's boys involved in this too, find somebody in the family that they trust and, and educate them. Do your diligence. Craig's website, ton of tools. We got a few. We have an info line. We'll, I email links to all kind of newsletters, the blue campaign. You can educate yourself like, like I did. You know, I mean, I didn't know anything about this six years ago. It's consumed my life to the point um, of transitioning out of my government work here in the next couple of years, I think, because this is where I need to be. I won't always say every day I want to be in it. I could guarantee you that. There's days I wake up and I'm like, oh, man, I just don't want to go in the office here again. But we have to. We have to. Or in 20 years, the fight's coming and, and we might not be in a position to survive it. So, I say that as a motivator, not as a downer. Everyone here has skills and capabilities to bring to the table, trust me. If I'm here, the bar is not set that high as far as the intelligence goes. <laughs> but your motivation, your heart, and your tenacity and resilience is, and, and we can certainly turn the scale on this and, and move the needle. Yeah, we can. Has anybody appreciated having a do-over in life of any, anything, anytime, anywhere? Like, man, I'm glad I got to do that again, because. I didn't like the way I did it the first time. <clears throat> well, I'm learning more and more at 59 years old that life is really, it's a series of, of second, third, and millionth chances. We have the, the joy uh, and the opportunity to navigate life's obstacles and challenges in a way that's better than we would have the day or the week before, the time before. And I'm, it's becoming more and more real to me, and I'm getting less and less bummed about anything that happens to me, a health uh, challenge, a financial challenge, no matter what it is. I am seeing it now for what it, it's always supposed to have been as an opportunity. Okay, how are you going to navigate this? Are you going to turn on those you care about? Are you going to fall down? and behave shamefully or are you going to navigate it although it's upsetting are you going to do it in a way that's honorable that feels good or at least it's better than you would have done before if so at a boy or at a girl and then the next challenge and then the next challenge life is that way we get the opportunity to improve how we deal with things each and every time and this predation on our children, this global predation is nothing but an opportunity for everybody to become a hero and do something in your own way. Every one of us can share information. Um, Vanessa ha has a great movie, Amber and Grace. Fantastic film. Our daughters actually got a song in that, that film. It'll alert people to the nature of child trafficking. Contraland, our, our feature film documentary, very powerful. You could share that with people. Watch it. Watch it on a big screen TV and with a good sound. Um, you'll, you'll be empowered and understand better what this problem looks like and what to do about it. And then share it with the biggest names and with the biggest mouths you know and encourage them. To, to be empowered from it as well. And then go to all of our websites and just see the tools and start learning and, and take that first step and go, oh, that felt pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm becoming a better person. I'm becoming part of the solution. I'm becoming a doer. And then after that first step, 
And then the second one, the next thing you know, you pick up kind of a, a momentum and a drive and, a, and an elevation all your own. You're like, man, life is, it feels good when I'm lifting people up and, and combating something that's ugly. Nobody said it would be easy, but it is satisfying when you know you're part of the solution. So there's a lot of ways that we can each do it. Um, Joe has a different contribution than I do, and Kim and all the rest of us, we're all on different individual journeys in our life. We have a different way that we can combat this. So I just want to encourage you to enjoy the process of finding what it is, what mark it is that you want to make. If not already, a lot of you are probably already involved. So bless you for it. But uh, I would say just because it's a dark uh, problem doesn't mean that you can't enjoy the beautiful solution, whatever you bring. You know, <clears throat> talking about do-overs, I think I'll read this. And, and we don't, we can look at this in history and learn about how we react to situations. And, and this, I came across this a couple of years ago with a friend and, and I thought, you know, this is, this is truly our society now. We look back and we look at history like, how did this happen? How did Hitler and the Nazi Germany regime, how did they literally almost take over the world? How did people let that happen? Today we sit there and go, yeah, never happened today, you know, but this guy was interviewed and he survived the Holocaust. Uh, well, he was a German, but he, he survived the, um, the war. And during this interview, he, he gave a statement. He said, you know, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. I attended church since I was a small boy, and we had heard stories of what was happening to the Jews. But like most people today in this country, the United States, we try to distance ourselves from the reality of what was really taking place. Besides, what can anybody do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and every morning, Sunday morning, we would hear the whistle from a distance of the clacking of the wheels moving over the tracks and we became disturbed when one Sunday we noticed the cries coming from the train as it passed us by. We grimly realized the train was carrying Jews. They were like cattle in those cars. Week after week that train whistle would blow and we would dread to hear the sound of those old wheels because we knew it was the Jews and as they passed they would begin to cry out. It was so terribly disturbing we could do, not, do nothing to help these poor, miserable people, yet their screams tormented us. We knew exactly at what time that whistle would blow, and we decided the only way to keep from being so disturbed by the cries was to start singing our hymns. By the time that train came rumbling past the churchyard, we were singing at the tops of our voices. If some of the screams reached our ears, we would just sing a little louder until we could hear them no more. Years have passed, and no one talks much about it anymore, but I can still hear that train and that whistle in my sleep. I can still hear them crying out for help. God forgive us all who called ourselves Christians, yet we did nothing to intervene. That was his experience after World War II, or during the war. As we mentioned earlier, we're not that same culture, the people sitting here. We have tools, we have education, we have information to act on. We don't have to be those folks there. They were stuck. And that guy probably died in torment of non-action. But that is not this society, that is not today, that is not here in Tucson, Arizona, or in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or across the country. Force in numbers, force in multipliers. Everybody brings something to the table, trust me. Uh, and it's our pleasure to be here with you folks. Uh, it's our pleasure to get to know you even the rest of the day, tonight possibly at the event. I don't fly out till tomorrow. There's information on the tables. Please reach out and ask us. If you, it, so many times too, how many, well, I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to ask this stupid question. Ask it, because I asked a ton of them in 2016, and uh, I'm glad I did, so. With that, I don't know, any questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll take any questions you might have for we we still got a couple minutes, yeah. Yes? How everybody feel about this and spreading the awareness if everybody just gets shut down for a Well, good question. Um, certainly, certainly social media is probably not the platform. As, as Kim said, once it starts to gain some traction, you're getting blocked. 
We have uh, we have a web page. Uh, we go on podcasts, local podcasts, iHeartRadio podcasts. Craig has a, a show. He, he's bucking that tech system. Uh, I think Craig can answer that best. I, I think you just don't get discouraged. You start little. We tell our volunteers or people want to ask how we help. Host an awareness event. The more people we get talking about it, the more people out there sharing it with their friends and families, it's going to gain traction and it'll overcome that media blockage. Yeah, terrorists, whenever we start tracking them with high tech means, they go low tech. Word of mouth only. Carrier pigeon style, style yeah. old school, right? right? So when big tech censors your posts, go private message, go phone call, go face to face. Um, Bounce to newer platforms that are not so hostile and, and go and share the, the information there. Realize that the dam is cracking. It's cracking faster and faster and these, these predators are getting more and more desperate. I'm talking about global predators. As the populace becomes more and more awake, more alert to the fact that we're all being deceived and lied to about so many things. On the healthcare front, on, on like whoo, Financial stuff, the child predation, they are starting to get more and more desperate because people are starting to go, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. What you told me there is not true, and I know that because it's already started to play out. We know you're lying to us now. So what happens from here? This is where a battle either gains momentum one way or the other. The, the momentum is starting to gain for we, the good people. So just be encouraged. Stand up, speak your voice, do it, do it accurately, do it respectfully, but do it boldly and encourage others to do the same because the momentum is just now starting and uh, the, the crooks will abuse every bit of power and authority they have, but we still hold the votes to, to elect them out of office if they're not serving our wishes. So we can do that and we need to be joint, united and network to do that. So. How do you do it when they're trying to silence you? You go around them and you be encouraged that you are such a threat that they're gonna, they're gonna, out of desperation, delete and hide your, your word because your voice is powerful because it's true. Okay. Hey, you look at Mothers Against Drunk Driving. They fought, they fought a billion dollar alcohol industry. It took them 20 years, but they won. Same concept. Perfect example. Yeah. Um, you mentioned political report cards when you were in Texas? Is that something that you're planning on doing nationwide with the different states or would you Yes ma'am, if I have my way, we will, all of we the people will judge anyone that we elect into any position on how they are in defense of the children. School board members, all of them. Are they doing stuff that's healthy for the children or are they doing things that are harmful? Sorry ma'am, you've got a failing report card on your your actions on our children you're out mm -hmm. sir ma'am if i have my way that's that's and kim's helping me craft that and we're starting to put it on our website and and i want to make it as intelligently executed and um effective as possible so it may be a morphing and growing effort but i, I think there's real potential with that because right now it's kind of not on the score sheet. They're like, nah, child trafficking, why, why do I care? Well, children are being destroyed on an industrial scale. And my wife says, how can God bless the USA when we're destroying his most precious and innocent at an industrial scale like this? She's like, what did these predators think was gonna happen as a father? I mean, I hope he's accurate with his lightning or his volcanoes or whatever happens, but, um, you know, it's our country. Thank God our founding fathers set about a system where we have representatives to, to our will. And so we have to stand up. We can't stay at home and let the opposition run everything and, and assert our will. We have to be loud and assertive and uh, with righteous indignation, not ugly, not rude but we have to win, okay? Because they will yell and scream and we can't allow them to scare us away and, and annoy us away from asserting our, our will uh, over our nation. So that's that's my two cents on that scorecard. Thank you. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there any progress being made on the on the demand side of it, like the people who are buying uh, pornography? And there are some now. When I when I founded Vets for Child Rescue in 2017. A lot of law enforcement agencies we worked with didn't really run a lot of sting operations. Now, all the ones that we're networking with, they're like, oh yeah, they know it, they know. It. So that's being run a lot. You see a lot, hundreds of arrests at a time now. So there is progress being made, but there's also elevation on the, the predator side. You know, there's still the, the, the porn that feeds the mind, that perverts and twists the mind into, into going into worse and worse depravities and getting into children and animals and you know, whatever uh, is still uh, unbridled. So there's a lot of work to be done, but, um, and even prisoners in prison now say, yeah, I can't wait to get out so I can start selling children because it's so lucrative now. So there's, it's growing on that end, but also law enforcement are starting to fight back and on an increasing level. But um, it's just, I think we're only scratching the surface. So we just really need to throw some fuel on the fire and demand that our culture return back to one that's protective of children rather than predatory, as has become the case. So now I quit. <laughs> hey, you be quiet. <laughs> no, hey, thank you all, and, and thanks for coming.